There we go. Welcome to the Future Comedy Show podcast, episode 28, with my good friend Rob Mayu. How you doing? What's up, dog? Subbed out <laughs> all the way, uh, all the way from Windsor it's, to, you, yeah, it's to, like, to Windsor to New York to Chicago back to Saginaw. Here we are. It's very hard to pinpoint where to say I'm even from at this point because it's like I travel around so much. It's like when people are introducing me, they're like, I, he's, "He lives in like Chicago now. He's from Canada. He lived in New York for a bit. <laughs> like, he's from places. He's yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. I travel. So uh, you're uh, you're you're a comic. You're a friend of mine. I just stayed at your house over uh, St. Patty's Day weekend. Fun times. We have done a nice uh, foreign exchange program here between the two. So. Yeah, I brought my twin size, put it on the on the floor, <laughs> got settled in with your. Uh, with your uh, drunk roommates yeah. and their friends. Yeah, they really fretted it up. Well, you came on, on St. Patrick's Day weekend. The best holiday so of the year in Chicago. Yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah, it's, like that's, it's going to get frat boyish on St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were fudged up. Yeah, uh, man. They go for it. They, they go hard. Yeah, they were, they were sitting there arguing over uh, if Jimi Hendrix is in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they were like, Jimi Hendrix, man! Duh. Wait, is he not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? No, he, I think he is. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure. Saying, he's got to be. Like, I feel like that would be like the first class of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame would be yeah, and Jimi the, Hendrix. And they were agreeing with each other that Jimi Hendrix was awesome, but like they like they were agreeing, but it sounded like they were disagreeing. Like, no, you don't even know, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm surprised one of them didn't fall asleep sitting up at some point. They tend to like a lot of times when things get like real crazy there. Uh, I, I get up in the morning and someone is just passed out. Not even get up in the morning. I come home at night because yeah. I'm still like way later than them. Mm-hmm. They live, like, real square lives. So, like, the weekend, they just go hard, where it's, like, the rest of the week, I come home at 4 o'clock in the morning and try to make sure a girl doesn't, like, scream <laughs> <laughs> and, and wake them up while They're like, they got to go sell this? computer stuff, yeah. So. Um, yeah, they, I had a pleasant time. Um, about yourself, uh, you were, how long have you been doing comedy for? Let's uh, let the audience at home know. Uh, I guess it'll probably be 11 years soon 11 enough, years. Yeah, so, I like to keep saying 10, because it's 10 sounds cleaner, yeah. but... Very yeah, funny. I gotta have to get off and start saying eleven pretty soon. <laughs> I think sometime in April it'll be eleven. Oh, congratulations! Oh, that's huge. Thanks. That's huge. <laughs> Thank you. Um, here we are. Um, there we go. There we go. Um, Thank you've you. you've uh, had the uh, pleasure of opening up with uh, s- some of the the <laughs> biggest names in comedy. Uh, Doug Stanhope, J- Big J Okerson. Uh, how how'd you find yourself in that kind of uh, situation? Um, well, the Doug thing was, uh, that was the first thing I ever did. And that was because he was doing a thing called just for spite at just for laughs at the time. Yeah. So like where the literally were like the barrier for just for laughs ended. He picked like the next bar and just started running like anti just for laughs shows there. Oh yeah. Cause they had offered him some crazy, like money for the nasty show one year where he would have got like a hundred dollars a show for like performing for like, it was like the, it, the deal is just terrible. Yeah. So his way slap in the face. Like, yeah. And he had already started a thing where he like had left comedy clubs and was doing like rock venues across the street. So he just did the same thing with Just for Laughs. But um, he called it Just for Spite. And in Canada, you know, when you're doing comedy in Canada, like Just for Laughs is everything. Yeah, it's the, it's it's the whole. It's a, it may be one of the biggest uh, festivals in North America, yeah, not well, just Canada. Yeah, it's the biggest comedy, it's the biggest strictly comedy festival in the world. The Edinburgh Fringe Festival is always technically, it's a bigger arts festival. Yeah. But uh, as far as strictly comedy, I mean, it's just for laughs is number one. Howie Mandel just bought it, weirdly enough. Really? Yeah, because the guy that owned it was, like, raping or whatever. You know what I mean? I don't remember exactly where on the, like, terror wow. alert chart of rape he was exactly. Yeah, orange, at least. He was somewhere enough that yeah. they had to take it away from him. So uh, Howie Mandel was, like, the... I don't know if he... You know, like, it was, like, Magic Johnson bought the Dodgers or whatever. Yeah. It's, like, it's probably not that much Magic Johnson money, but, like, he's the figurehead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's the same shit with Howie Mandel. And Howie Mandel's from Canada, too, right? <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah, like, yeah. one of the... Him and Jim Carrey are, like, the the, the couple heads on the... Yeah, on sure. The, I don't the love The Canadian that. Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'll throw John Candy up there, I guess. Oh, John Candy and uh, um, Bieber? Uh, and Bieber, yeah. He's known <laughs> for his... Uh, and Drake. But, um, it... Uh, so he was doing that thing, and nobody wanted to do it because everyone was afraid of like doing just for spite because it's like, yeah, you know, you don't want to ruin your career. But I was two years in; I was like, I don't have a career to ruin. At yeah. this point. So I like sent a video to whatever the thing was to send a video, and they're like, "Yeah, cool, come do it." No money, no anything. It was just like I just wanted to come do it. I remember me, and my girl at the time, packed up our Prius, and we our plan was just we were just go sleep in the Prius in the back. Yeah, yeah there, there you go. And um, we got there. Whatever in the first night, like we and the first night we, I think we crashed in someone else's hotel room floor. Literally the next, the second night of it, 
Doug was just like, yeah, me and Bingo fucked last night. We're not going to today for sure. So you might as well just use the other bed. And just, really? I just crashed. Like, I've crashed in a hotel room with Doug Stanhope an odd amount of times. <laughs> it's very loose with just being like, there's two beds in this hotel room. Why yeah. are you getting another room? Um, so uh, that's actually how I found any Practical Jokers. It was a long night sleeping in a hotel room with, uh, with Stanhope. But, uh, so I did that, and then he wanted a tour, he wanted a tour across all of Canada because he had done Toronto and Montreal. Mm-hmm. So I remember they were like, he was, you know, his manager was looking for like venues. I had never been at any of the rest of Canada. Yeah. But I was like, oh, I can help. Yeah. Yeah. And, anyway. Uh, you know what I mean? And so I just like found venues that like would take us on, on just like any venue that would just give us a hundred percent of the door. It didn't really fucking matter what the venue was in Calgary. We were playing like this heavy metal bar that was big enough and gave us a hundred percent of the door. Like these are the, those were the first two things you needed. Yeah. And then. Does this ven- venue suck dick for comedy? Was third. Yeah, yeah. After you know, um, so that's that's a that's a, a good way. Uh, and I feel I feel like I see a lot of comics that it, I, when they're starting out is just getting where they fit in. You know, it's not about the money in the very beginning. Just finding a way that you can be helpful so you can learn about the business. Sure, and well, I mean, I, nothing was more influential than doing it that way because I've totally learned how to like. I mean, I became the cut the middleman of the industry out person because mm-hmm. of where I was like, I was trying to always find ways to like, how do you just get around, get around shit. You do need a healthy, what I will, I think I got too immersed in that probably early on um, because like I got so fucked the industry and it's like, I like now as I'm further along in this, I like some gatekeepers, you know, it's like you need some people who are saying no. Yeah. Um, it's the only way you get better. If you completely work around shit, it's like, all right, well, then how do you fucking know anything? You know what I mean? Like, you don't really necessarily know. It's a mixture of doing it yourself and having gatekeepers. I think that marriage where you go, I get to this point, the gatekeepers say no, I go do it my own until... Until they say yes. yes again. And then you do that again until they get... And I think it's just that you have to do that back and forth. Like, I, I honestly think, you know, if you got an honest moment at the Doug about it, he would be a little bit like, I bet you he'd probably like to be in the industry a little bit more, you know, because yeah. he's in the fucking, not that he's chosen to live in Bisbee, but like, he's just not, there's just something about, you know, the fun part of this business is like, is just for laughs. Yeah. You know, thank God I didn't get banned from just for laughs because like, it's a great time, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> that'd be horrible. And, and it's just like, it's just, a, and it's not even like, I, I mean, could I survive in comedy without ever doing just for laughs again? Of course I could, but it's like a great, it's just like a, it's camp for comedy. You know what I mean? Like comedy it's a really camp, lovely time. With your backpack. He's got so much free booze and everyone's there and yeah. it's just your fucking party and all in the same hotel. It's like, it's perfect. So, you know, I'm glad I didn't lose that, but it was like a good lesson. Yeah. You know, I would still probably work for Yuck Yucks right now in Canada. <laughs> if I wasn't for that, so. Yeah. Well, and that, when that was a thing that happened to you, uh, early on, uh, in your career that you were, you were at Yuck Yucks, right? And um, then I got signed pretty quick. Like, Two, sorry, I'm making it. But by the way, am I playing Ithaca, Michigan? No, I'm in Ithaca, Michigan. Uh, oh, okay. Jessica, okay. Uh, I can't yeah. wait to be in Ithaca, Michigan. I think that's April 7th. I'm playing the hardwoods. And also, let me plug this right now if you guys are watching. Uh, Rob and myself and KJ will be at the 702 Bar in Midland tonight. Um, Wednesday night, we're in Hemlock, Michigan at Jen's Place. And then uh, Thursday, we're at Bottoms Up at 8 o'clock as well. Okay. Uh, so we have those three shows. Plug's done. Cool. All right. I just wasn't sure because I had... Sorry, Jessica. I'm glad you're not excited that I'm coming to Ithaca, Michigan. <laughs> Jessica Van Hoos. Well, maybe next time, you know, yeah, that we'll yeah. get there. Then uh, um, Tor- Torfer Harrison. Uh, Torfer's my dude. Oh, that's your dude? He I said, am a I'm boy. a boy. <laughs> you sure are, Torfer. Yeah. Sure are. And way to go there. And then <laughs> Jessica's excited. I'm excited to go there, Jessica. Can I plug Torfer's show, by the way? Well, yeah, go ahead. I don't, uh, I don't know who Torfer is, but for sure. Where... Torfer's one of my best friends. Okay. Yeah, uh, we started in comedy together. He was weirdly. He was in a very different situation than most people. He was an American who started comedy in Canada. Wow. Backwards. Pretty backwards. Um, but it was Toronto. He was a good scene. He's a Detroit, uh, Gross Point, Romeo, Michigan guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, he, so we, I mean, we've been friends for a long time. He had to, like, kind of drop out of stand-up after a bit. He was a pretty big alcoholic. And, uh, <laughs> and by, Topher, like, turned me on to the idea that AA is even necessary for anybody. Because I was a staunchly anti-AA person yeah. until, like, Topher was in my life enough where I was like, Oh, some people need this yeah. for sure. We called it the day of a thousand cunts, and uh, because we just got drunk in the. Oh wait, I'm allowed to just. Say yeah, you can say whatever you want, but I'm just. Um, it was so it happened. Uh, Fearless Fred used to. He was a radio guy in Toronto. Used to have us come in like almost basically like once a week in the mm-hmm. afternoon, and in our minds it was like, well, radio is way more fun if you get drunk. We were talking about this on the way over. Yeah. You just find reasons to booze every every time, 
So we would get drunk in the afternoon. Now, here's the thing. I can get drunk in the afternoon and then be fine afterwards. I could either stop <laughs> getting drunk at that point yeah. or just, you know what I mean, whatever. I can continue getting drunk in a constructive manner. And constructive. <laughs> so for once you get him drunk in the afternoon, it just he's just going to keep drinking super hard at that level, or whatever. So there was one day where we just had to like cut bait with him, where we were like, we were like, this is too. He was just calling everyone he ran to a cut. Yeah, like, <laughs> man, we just I can't fight everyone in Toronto for you. Uh, and I don't even know Topher. I mean, right in if you remember what the fuck happened to you that day because I don't really remember. I, I, we found him at the dog's bollocks, which is a, like a divey bar in Toronto like like hours later but I don't remember exactly what he got into but um his show now so he got out kind of got a stand up but he's still doing a show called Keeper Cast and I love it what it is is it's a show actually a lot like this where it's yeah. it's, it's, it's a video component thing I think he twitches it I passed out at a bar there we go oh, funny getting attention on his service podcast <laughs> um he uh is essentially uh he like uh is a collage a collection of like the best autistic people he's found online. Really? People who are already doing stuff, you know what I mean? Like a, a guy who would put out videos who was very clearly pretty autistic that like likes this one thing or like one cross dresses or what. So he's found this like collage of uh of these people and now he just does a show. Like Howard Stern used to have with the the rat the brat pack where he'd have them like they were all kind of there. He would do the show, and then when he needed to bring one in, he'd bring them in for a little bit or whatever. Yeah, and have them talk, and it would it like it's it's fascinating. So and it's like he's this, having, he finds real autistic people and has them on the show. And has them on the show. It's always live. It's all live streamed in. So he does a show like this, and then he just has oh, them patched okay. In. So they come through like Facebook Live. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. So, but um, and he has all these ones he finds. So it's called the Keeper Cast because occasionally he finds ones that's a that's a keeper. Yeah. And and whatever, but I mean, it's it's a I mean it's a little exploitive. Oh, Keeper Cast. Okay, yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, the Keeper Cast. So. Well, that's he, um, like rude. Like, I can't. Not. <laughs> and, yeah, and so, like, and it's always, I mean, he's he, he was, like, the 12th most popular Periscope account in the world at one point. Really? He, just, he embraced it. He did it right. He, like, made episodes. And so when that was, like, when Periscope was going, he just did it right and, like, got himself to that level. He's a super funny dude. He just, I mean, just he, the, the structure of stand-up was not. I remember even when he was doing stand-up, we were opening for Jim Norton once. And uh, he hired this old man. To, he has a he had a joke about like how he like stole Amelia Earhart's like jacket or it's like your, your grandpa's jacket or something. Anyways, the punchline of this was an old man he had hired for like by the way all the money he made on the show to yeah. to hire this this like actor to come on stage and mouth kiss him after the bit really or whatever. He just had this old man come in and go that's my jacket and whatever. And he goes and grabs a jacket. And he's like one more kiss and he just mouth kisses. Really him. It exploded. It's huge. Yeah, it was great. It murdered. Worth the worth the, yeah, the, you the know. fifty seventy five bucks. Well, it was a hundred bucks. I think he spent a hundred bucks on an old man. Wow, <laughs> um, old men are getting a hundred dollars for mouth kiss. Wow, <laughs> like the Tilford puts. I abuse mentally challenged people for money. Hey dog, I'm trying to make this uh, sound gentle on you. So, um, <laughs> but uh. Uh, yeah, so he and he also he runs like uh, three quarter houses. I mean, maybe I shouldn't plug that after all the other things I said. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. The, he the like Canadian does, authorities are he gonna get him. No, he's in uh, he's in L.A. now, oh, Orange okay. County. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, because he went he he got deported out he of got, Canada. Really? Yeah. Well, because you can only I mean the same way you can really only stay for so long. He, so after school was done, you have like two years to find a job in your career field, right? Yeah. And uh, or you have to leave. And uh, he was signed with Yucks, but Yucks. It isn't technically considered a job in your career field because they won't open up their books to the Canadian government. We're, we were all technically not employees of Yuck Yucks. We were really? independent contractors. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't a job in his field or whatever. So they had to, they deported him. I remember wow. too, one of the last like little bit he was living there, um, the, uh, we were in Buffalo doing a gig and we got smashed in Buffalo. My ex was driving us. And we get to the, the window at the border and... Uh, his papers had legitimately been chewed up by his dog. <laughs> that is the truth. They, they, his dog got a hold of his like work visa yeah. or whatever and like chewed it up a bunch. So we get to the thing and he hands his paperwork over and they're like, what happened to this? And he smashed. So he goes, my dog ate it. Or yeah, whatever, yeah. Which is the truth. Yeah. Like when you're but they didn't believe him. They're like, like, oh, it. yeah, right. So they pull his in to the customs and he walk right as he walks in, he pukes. All over the floor of customs, oh. immediately just pukes all over the place. Wow! So they're like, get him to the fucking bathroom, and like he's just like, I had to go help him because he's just opening doors, like trying to find a bathroom to like interrogation rooms and stuff. <laughs> 
and uh, and my ex is, is like dealing with the paperwork. The paperwork's supposed to be seven. He didn't get it replaced because it's supposed to be seventy five dollars. The Canadian government not only let him into country, they replaced his paperwork for free. Really? He never had a problem. They did eventually get rid of him, but wow, that's insane. Yeah, we're very kind people. Well, and then that's crazy because if you have a DUI, you can't get into the country. Yeah, but if you're throwing up on the way in, if you're hammered as a passenger, that's yeah, fine. there you go. We're, we're real cool with that. I like the I like the the fine line. There. Yeah. The best part is too is that on the way out, he went who puked, and then that was he didn't even line. know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Good wow. night, everybody. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, trooper. Uh, Topher was saying that he's starting to think you were a oh you weren't a great influence. Well, I, I was definitely a um, like because again I can do that. So like. For me, I mean, he wasn't a great influence. For me to have that guy in my life, I can go get drunk with you in the afternoon. I'm fine. That won't affect my life in any way. I'll go get work done. Yeah. Hammered. Like, I don't care. Um, I just have the right genes for it, you know? Yeah. Levi's. Uh, <laughs> sorry? That's a Levi's. Yeah. Um, all Saints and everything, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, it's – he just didn't have it. It's like he just – he was a mess with it. So he lived on my couch for six months. Holy shit. Yeah, you yeah. You let somebody live on your couch for six yeah, months? Yeah, we had in a two – bedroom apartment that my uh that evan would have told you the time was a one and a half bedroom apartment wow uh because it was like one of them was the one bedroom was much smaller and so we had me and my chick evan in the other room and Topher on the couch we were just and it was a nice condo but yeah uh, it was a brand new condo but we just flop house the fuck out of it oh yeah um so we were just we were just all there to get drunk in the afternoon like my my girl would leave because she had a real person fucking thing to do. Yeah. And then there's just three comics sitting around getting hammered in the afternoon. So like, Getting into shenanigans. Yeah, and, yeah, which is real fun. Yeah, great times until Topher had to go back to back home to Detroit. And then uh, there you go. Uh, Topher said, I got to go check out the show out today on Twitch at 4 p.m. Pacific Twitch TV keeper cast 69 there you go there we go yeah well i'll definitely check that out that's enough for stuff that's at seven seven o'clock yeah seven o'clock so we'll be actually on our way to our show at the 702 but but can you can you watch it afterwards um i don't even know Uh, tofer i just go to that thing man i don't know how twitch works that well tofer sends me stuff and i'm just proud of him you know yeah i don't know know you're like you're doing something you're off the couch you're pumped yeah exactly i'm just like a proud parent i have no idea i'm like you play with your little odds tofi and he's like i think he's probably making more money than me honestly doing it well the twitch they can make good money on there yeah man Logan is going to change Twitch I think yeah because his new studio they're going to start uh, twitching comics uh, doing billiards with them like playing pool really and they're going to uh, start twitching uh, archery really yeah and it's like it's Rogan so it's going to get views you know what Mm -hmm. I mean it's going to bring like new eyeballs to Twitch if I knew how to put money in Twitch right now based on Joe Rogan alone I would do it is it there's a is there a stock for it? I have or? not looked into this whatsoever. I literally just came up with that idea in my head like, as we're talking. It. So yeah. I don't know. I yeah, no well, idea. for real though, because a lot of people are just watching people play video games and in tents. So like, why not watch comedians you like play, play pool, archery, uh, or I whatever? mean, we watch comedians do pretty much anything. Yeah. You know, just talk bullshit about things that we really have. And Twitch is this interesting new way to come out. Of, you know, it's like imagine Jerry Seinfeld had the option that he could have twitched comedians in cars getting coffee. You know, he yeah. wouldn't have done it because no. it's him. Because he likes the editing. He's so specific. But, but you know, it's like you could have just done the same thing on Twitch. And I mean, think about how easily you could. You'd probably make way more money than Jerry's making off of it. Maybe. You know, oh, Jerry's a good businessman, but whatever. yeah, I mean, he could. But he's a he's a old school businessman. Again, it's cutting out the like industry middleman yeah. stuff is where you really start making money. The Netflix. So. Well, the, didn't he just have a? Didn't Jerry just have a thing with like a? Hyundai or something in the beginning or like some kind of car was um, sponsoring it yeah, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. it went from YouTube to Netflix yeah now Netflix bought all the old episodes is that how that went? I don't know if new episodes are going to Netflix I haven't looked into it they might have just bought it the same time that they bought that fucking Jerry jacking off to himself fucking special he put out Jerry jacking off to himself I mean, oh wow did you see that thing yeah he was just talking about his career what and how he went he's like a- this is the first joke I did back in the what yeah. masturbation that was. I mean, that thing sucked. <laughs> well, he liked him. Well, he, it was for the nostalgia of people who really, really look up to him. Because there's a lot of people that look up to him as like, this sure. is the guy who knows how to write a joke for real. Let you know? 
somebody make that for you. I don't know. You just don't make your own fucking self-aggrandizing documentary. <laughs> like, that's just a bizarre thing to do. I'm like, gonna. I'm, I'm just like, this is me waking up. Here's my fridge. It's got LaCroix in it. And uh, that's what I'll do. It's just gonna be Mike yelling, I started comedy in Saginaw. Yeah. <laughs> Before me, there was Shooters. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, there was Shooters, that was the name. That was the only club in town with okay. Shooters. And uh, there was a guy, Dan Ballard, who runs the VU now. He used to run the show, and everybody always has, like, really good things to say about the old club, but I guess, uh, it's, like, too big, or okay, whatever, sure, like, sure, sure. the heating bills were too much, I'm not sure. Oh, just, like, oh, wait, it was a dedicated comedy club. Yeah, they oh, had one here, ah, and, like, they had okay. some acts come through, I guess they had Carrot Top, and sure. they had a bunch of people come through, and this were, like, all the, all the comics have been doing it for a long time, always tell me, like, oh, yeah, man, that used to be the best place, we used to go down there all okay. the time, and, and then... Shut down before I even thought about doing yeah, stand up. Yeah. Shooters and Saginaw, another bad little alliteration either. I like yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Alliteration's where it's at. Alliteration's very important. Let's not underestimate how much alliteration helps. Counts. Things. It counts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I would have liked a nice alliteration name if I could have had it, but. Yeah. Rob Rayu. 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 So, uh, you want to talk about, I mean, you want to talk about kind of like your beginning in life or like anything about that? Like, or no, <laughs> or do you want to save that for your, my birth for, canal? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't for, mean, I, the thing about, for, the, say for your set tonight or, uh, with adoption stuff, man, in the end, it's like, I don't really know that much. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm just starting to like get a little bit of information and then I'll get it all at once. Like that's the thing. So when I start the podcast and I actually find my birth parents. Oh yeah. And that's what you're, that's what you're doing. We can promote that a little bit. Sure. You're going to be starting a podcast. Yeah, Cause I already got episodes in the can and stuff. Like it should be probably like two more months. I'm treating it very preciously because I, um, I want to, first of all, I want to pitch it to networks. I, I have like one network interested, but I, you know, there's a couple other ones. I'm also would like to at least yeah. see. So like I'm, I'm putting episodes in the can and also, because it's so I'm gonna the thing I'm adopted and I've never found my birth parents I don't really particularly I never really gave much of a shit honestly yeah I think it also it's, it's honestly because I thought it would be like disrespectful to my parents to some way weirdly whereas like I I didn't want them to feel like they weren't enough so I never had any interest in doing it but um you know the impetus was my friend Bobby Mayer uh, a comic from Canada that lives in England now is also adopted and he went to find his birth parents and he like found his mom, found her name, found her on Facebook, and was like monitoring her for like a month. Yeah. And in that month, he saw on Facebook she passed away before he no ever contacted way. her. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, what are the chances that in that month you would, you know? Yeah. Um, so then I was like, oh, here's the thing. I have a finite amount of time. I could even find these people. So like, say I don't, I don't necessarily, and I have no like burning desire in me right now. But maybe in 20 years, if I have a kid, which I probably won't, but if I do, yeah, if I whatever, if I get like some sort of weird cancer, something, yeah, I need a, a kidney, whatever, I might regret not being able to meet them or, or know them. And so I'm like, let's just, we'll just do it. But then also let's make a little career gain out of it, you know, like, let's yeah. make a thing. Let's mm -hmm. put some, and then also like adopted is a very underserved, it's a very large group. I don't, I don't want to say minority because it's like. I mean, we are in the minority of people, yeah. but, but like it's a weird thing to call it a minority because we're not like oppressed in any particular way. Yeah, you don't but, want to, yeah, it's a like, negative I connotation. I don't to want it. to add some struggle to being adopted. I mean, you know, it, it's a, well, it there is a struggle. People. It fucks with some people. Yeah, I think I got out of it fairly well adjusted, but that's also you know has a lot to do probably with the circumstance afterwards. But um, I I think there's like a lot of stuff people don't know about adoption. Like adoption didn't exist. Uh, it's less than 100 years old. Really? Well, because baby formula is less than 100 years old. So, like, you couldn't uh, have a baby that was up for adoption before baby formula because you had to breastfeed a baby to keep it alive. So you wouldn't have, you know, you, you could only give up babies for adoption, you know, a year into their life. And at that point, it's like, how many people are even doing that anymore? Yeah. You, know, you get attached to this baby. You yeah, once you have a baby like for tit. more than a year, yeah, it's You know yours. what I mean? Like, you're not just going to give that up. So. Yeah, that's the rule. Once you suck on a tit, it's yours. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You own that thing now. So, uh, I, uh, I, um, you know, there's a lot of things. People, we were indentured. I mean, I don't like saying slaves necessarily because that, then again, I also sound like I'm, I just, I'm always afraid I'm putting some like, you hear that black people? We were slaves too. Like, I don't yeah. mean that, but like we were, we were indentured servants. Adopted kids would be sold off to uh, orphan farms. And, like, so essentially, an orphan farm, you would pay to take your kid. Really? And, and then the kid would just grow up on the farm just working for the farm. 
So like that was until like 1929, that was like the regular practice for adoption. There was also a thing called the orphan train, which was like to buy kids or whatever, like if you needed someone on the farm or even just to take them, they would put these, like as America was expanding westward, the train would go westward because they needed more labor further and further yeah. west. They'd stick these orphan kids on a train and then just send them on their way town, and then you would place babies on a platform and people would go i'll take that one you know wow like, and that was like how adoption worked for the longest time and this is things that like no one has any idea i didn't even know i didn't know anything about that <laughs> so, how what, what, that's not even taught in school or anything um because well, i mean what do you, you know, i mean you what just, information do you even need it for you know yeah. it's like it's just it's just only history i mean it has no real like legacy to it now but it's interesting and it's Seven million people in America are adopted. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. not nobody. I used to have this thing where I would, like, because I always talk about how I don't have adopted fans. And I would always say how, um, like, Russell Peters can, like, fill a, an arena full of Indian people in Omaha, Nebraska. And yeah. I can get two adopted people that come to Saginaw, Michigan. And uh, I always thought that it was because the Indian population was much larger. I always just dismissed it as, like, well, of course, more Indian people than there's adopted people. Two million Indian people in America, seven million adopted people. Really? There's no community for it whatsoever. You know what I mean? Like, there's no, like, we just don't really. Ad- I've started finding some. There's this uh, adoption bloggers. There's, like, small community things. Yeah, but, and like, you could be their leader. Hey, you know what? I was, I'm, a, I'm an Aries. I'm a born leader. Yeah, so. you tell them, come over, <laughs> sleep on the couch. I'll get <laughs> yeah, you drunk. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. you go. Uh, you know other famous uh, people who were adopted? Okay. Uh, I, Dave Thomas from Wendy's. Dave Thomas from Wendy's. So, uh, uh, <laughs> Snooky. Snooky was adopted. Uh, Steve Jobs is the big one. For oh, sure. yeah. Personal yeah. favorite, Ric Flair. Ric Flair. Yeah. yeah. Woo! Yeah. Flair was, was adopted. Um, I'm trying to think. There's one more. Because I, I, that's the thing. Part of the podcast is, is like, well, I mean, those are lofty people to try to get on the podcast. Well, Steve Jobs especially. But, yeah. <laughs> um, Edgar Allan Poe. Well, and, and, and Edgar Allan Poe, really? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. He dead also, and Dave Thomas and Wendy's also dead. Uh, so, you know, I got Snooky left. Then you got <laughs> also uh, Babe Ruth, Malcolm X, Eleanor Roosevelt. Huh. Malcolm X, eh? And there's a whole – Jack Nicholson. Uh, wow, there is Nicole Richie, Jamie Foxx. Oh, yeah, I should know Nicole Richie. She yeah. does not look like Lana Richie. So. <laughs> that makes sense, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew Jamie Foxx. He was on my list as well, too. So, um, yeah. there's a, and, and by the way, there's a ton of movies about being adopted, which I didn't realize. So that's one of the things we're doing, too, is like I'll bring an adopted person in. And we'll just um, watch the Blind Side together. Watch the We just did like Manchester by the Sea with a with a kid who had a very Matt Brown who had a very similar situation. Yeah. Manchester by the Sea. It ended up being not that similar. That movie is barely about what we thought it was going to be about. I don't even. I've never heard of it. It was that uh, Casey Affleck movie that was nominated for uh, Academy Awards last year, and then everyone was mad because Casey Affleck like showed his dick or something. What? Yeah, uh, Casey Affleck did something funky. I don't remember exactly what it. I love that all of these stories end in. And some dude involved did something rapey, and now I don't remember what it is. <laughs> that's that's, that's um, the whole history of show business. Yes. Uh, so that was another one of those movies. A pretty good movie. It wasn't bad, but it was like one of those, like, everyone in Boston is broken movies. Yeah. That all the Afflicks have to make. So. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing here it was the Academy Award winner, uh, Casey Affleck. Oh, one. And, okay, cool. uh, Kenneth Longgren, best original screenplay. Sure. You can get it on Amazon Prime right now. Uh, that's what I did. Not my Amazon I'll... Prime account. Thanks. A girl named Lexi I slept with one time that left her Amazon Prime account. Ah. Appreciate you, girl. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good for you, man. That's, was, a, that's how you keep those residual friends with benefits. She uh, she le- she put it in and she was like, please just don't uh, ever order anything with this. And I was like, I won't. And I haven't. That's I've good. just used it occasionally to watch something on Amazon Prime I need. So There you go. That's Appreciate a good deal. Yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. good deal that like, you know I mean? Yeah, you came together as one, and then you parted yeah, yeah, ways. But exactly. still, you guys can keep your spirit together if they have like the power it. of the internet. If you hook up long enough, like if you're single long enough or whatever, you'll just end up with like HPV and a Netflix account. <laughs> HPV <laughs> and HBO Go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'll get you'll get them. You'll get some passwords. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I have Netflix for the same reason. I'm not paying for any of that stuff. Apple Music. I haven't fucked my way into Apple Music yet. Yo, but. good luck, man. Yeah, good yeah, luck yeah. with that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough that's a tough cookie to crumble. Uh, Eric Walensky said, "Something Mike, that's a weird New York Yankees emblem you have on." What? Your Zoo York. Oh, my Zoo York. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was like, what? All right. Uh, Eric's a comic. Uh, he's a very funny guy. And then Robert Clark, Clark is watching. What's up, Rob? How you doing, buddy? Um, 
Yeah, feel free to ask Rob any questions. He is our uh, our uh, Robinson. Are you still watching? You can chime in too. He's a good comic in Chicago. He's oh yeah. He says he's watching. Does it stay when they stop watching, or do I only know when they start watching? No, they don't. That'd be like so bad. Like, when it says ah, stop watching, it like start watching. All right, goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice stop. to see you. Start stop. Ah, fuck, stop it. We're we're holding uh, pretty steady at uh, four or five views. Cool. No, it's like PBS up in this bitch. Sure. Yeah, we're doing it. I mean, you're uh, you are putting a lot of pressure on people to take time out of their day at. Six eleven, and, and uh, you know what I mean. Like oh, it's they can watch it later. That's the good thing about it. They can point, stay yeah. up and they can watch it for whatever. They can find out about your your history of uh, HPV. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no confirmed HPV by yeah. the way. I just assume. Yeah, <laughs> I just assume. Um, I don't have the kind that like makes your pussy explode or anything. Oh, that's that's, that goes, so. that's good. That's good. Uh, was it did your foot? We touch foot. We touch foot a lot. By the way, I don't want to make you touch my foot and then but... try to buy buy me lunch. Yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, this to is going fair, quick. It's going quick. I tried to buy you lunch first and then I started yeah. touching your feet. You knew about the HBO Go. Yeah, yeah. you knew you knew about uh, Apple <laughs> Music. I, like, I need that password. I don't have HBO Go yet, so I could use that one. Yeah. Um. One thing, uh, one thing, uh, you get to open up for uh, Big J, who's one of my favorite comics, who does a lot of crowd work. I do a lot of crowd work, so I kind of look up to him. How did that come about? Um, I before J, the first time I ever met J was the Just for Laughs it, when Just for Laughs used to do a full festival in Toronto, which didn't really work. Just for Laughs does a very stripped town Toronto version now, yeah, um, called JFL Forty Two, which is actually great, but the JFL didn't work. But the only show I went to saw the Nasty Show, um. And it was uh, uh, Jason Rouse was my was a buddy at the time that I went because of him. But then uh, it was Patrice, Big J, Nick DiPaolo, Jimmy Carr, and I guess Rouse would have been the last one. Yeah, that's and, a um, solid lineup. Yeah, and, and Patrice was closing, DiPaolo was hosting, and obviously Jimmy Carr was considered a big spot on it. Oh, I yeah. must have been missing somebody because I feel like there would have been one more linchpin there. But Jay was still relatively unknown. They just just for laughs knew how good he was. Yeah. So they put him on as a killer that people didn't necessarily know, and a sneaky, um, a little sneaky, sneaky. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I'm, I don't talk. It was. I mean, we've been friends now for like seven years, probably. Wow. So this is like a, a bit back for him. Yeah. And um, I remember he did he did this joke on this is not happening about it was about Lewis actually fucking this girl and uh, but they like lived around the corner. So Lewis texted him, uh, Jay and Dave, like, hey, I'm fucking this girl. Come, like, watch in the window. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then so whatever, he's doing it. But while he, Lewis was getting blown, and the girl's on all fours blowing Lewis, and her dog comes up behind and, like, starts licking her pussy while she's blowing Lewis. Wow. And, like, the story, like, the girl doesn't turn around. I mean, just Jay, lets him just, go at it. Watch the story, and this is not happening. But I remember just being like, that's, I, like, I always that's remember that bit. Shit. That bit was amazing. Yeah. And so... We were outside hanging out afterwards, and uh, has, this is such a very funny run-in. With, like my only time meeting Patrice ever, it um, I went first of all. Nick DiPaolo kept thinking I was his driver for some reason was a real thing, and uh, <laughs> you're his driver. Yeah, like because there's like they they send you like these like black minivans or whatever just for laughs like yeah. pick you up. So like these production vans. So uh, I was like standing near the production van because I was just hanging out with them, and because uh, I was with Rouse and his friends and. Uh, and then so Nick kept whatever, but the I went up to Big J. I was like, dude, that was like, you know, I gave him like a nice compliment. Yeah, and I always remember the only time I ever met Patrice because Patrice thought I was saying it to him like, <laughs> behind him and like turned around to like accept a compliment, and I was talking to Jay. Yeah, and then it was that was it. That was my entire interaction ever having with Patrice O'Neill was just not complimenting him. <laughs> uh, uh, as long as he didn't strike me that night, the material I love Patrice, but th- that night whatever Jay was like yeah. much more. I, I, Patrice was just doing stuff like that. I just it wasn't like what he, be, he became, but um, yeah. I uh, so I liked him from that, and then I was running the Dark Comedy Festival, so no one had knew Jay. So I was like, yeah, let's bring. I remember I had the first year was Jim Jeffries, yeah, which was like perfect timing because Jim was like just popping, yeah, at that time. So like it went crazy. I remember he actually we was getting a green card, so I was going to have him come to Canada in May. And then we had to delay it to September for because he had to get his green card. He couldn't leave the country. So – because, like, when you get your green card here, you just have to stay here. Yeah. Because they take your passport and shit away from you. So the entire time you're, like, waiting for your green card to come in, there's, like, nothing you can do. I remember I was with Jim Jeffries twice in that time. And uh, he uh, – it was in Toronto, which, by the way, he fell in love with Topher. And because uh, Topher was such an alcoholic at the time, he really enjoyed Topher. And then I was with him in – 
Vancouver and in Vancouver, like the FBI was like doing another check on Jim to like make sure he gets, I remember he was sober Jim, uh, because he was like right before he was getting legit the TV show. So he was like, um, was like sobering up and trying to get a little thinner and whatever for it. Yeah. Try to look a little better. And, um, so he had one drink with us in Toronto and that was it. And then in Vancouver, because the FBI called him in between shows or whatever his eight manager, not the FBI, I don't think, but like I think his manager said the FBI has to do like an extra additional whatever. Really? And he just got like in his head, because he was getting a fucking TV show and now he's like, I might not get a green card. So he wow. freaked out. So by the end of the night, we were at like a Coke stripper party. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like he went from I'm being sober right now to like just we're off the, r- off, off, the yes. off the yes. edge there. Um, but the first year, so it was Jim, and then uh, which was like the linchpin, and I had Jamie Kilstein, ironically, who I mean, it just ended up. I mean, he's back now, and he's apologized for his little. Sp- I don't know if you know who Kilstein no. is. No, he got like way far into like social justice warrior dumb. Oh yeah, I think I heard about this guy. Yeah, was so, he on the uh, Rogan podcast? He was on the Rogan podcast, and like yeah. and then like he went like super far into it, and mm-hmm. then it all turned on him. Like mm-hmm. like the wave came back and sucked him in an undertow. And I remember when I watched that Rogan podcast, I was like, I wonder if I'll get an apology from Jamie Kilstein. And then like three days later, I got an email from him being like, Hey man, sorry I was a cunt. And that was what did whatever. he? What was he saying to you? Um, well, the thing with me and him because we were buddies. When I go to New York, like me and Kilstein would get like vegan lunch and we would whatever vegan lunch. Yeah, yeah, he's, oh, that's hardcore. Vegan. Yeah, he, he was like, you know, we were like buddies enough. And uh, he, you know, in for whatever reason, something about uh, you know, when again another rapey thing. Uh, Woody Allen was in the news. And he has said like, if you don't like think Woody Allen's a rapist or something, like don't like you're a bad person or something. And yeah, when it comes to the Woody Allen one, look, I'm ri- if I just if there's two accusations against anybody, I'm pretty willing to like go okay, two accusations. I'm pretty good at dismissing you at this point. Like if there's serious allegations. Because generally speaking, it's going to be very hard to get two separate people to cooperate the story. What's the point? But do you really think there's as many women trying to like get together to ruin you? Yeah, two is almost enough for me. With Woody Allen, it's like there's one allegation from an eight year old child. It's like I just don't. I'm not saying he's not a rapist, but like I was not willing yeah. to condemn him as a rapist because I don't fucking know. Yeah, I think it's like inappropriate for me, Rob Mayu, to step in and be like, "You're a rapist," you know? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I've never not. even heard of that, but maybe <laughs> he, um, you know, was supposedly. Diddled his uh, Dylan Farrow, who was Mia Farrow and his um, daughter, but like Mia Farrow also hated him at the time, and like they went to court about it. He was innocent, but like also he's a very powerful man, so it's whatever. Yeah. You know, it's like it's this gray area. So all I ever said to Jamie was like, and online was like, yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to just like definitively say the man's a rapist because I just don't yeah. feel like comfortable in that position, and so he just blocked me on everything for it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's how deep but it's it was weird to get in those conversations over social media. That's the yeah, but I'm all those arguing. You know, oh, I mean, so you're just trying to argue, yeah, so. you are just trying to argue. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not just trying to argue, but like that was a person that I was like, oh, I know Jamie, and like yeah. I figured we could have a reasonable conversation about it, just going like, hey, do you really think that's appropriate? You know, like because that's all it really was my point was is like you feel so comfortable that he raped a person in the '80s that you don't know that you're like willing to just do that. I was like that's. It seems crazy to me that you're yeah. that comfortable. Um, again, Bill Cosby, yeah, we're comfortable. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, of course well, we're that's, an, that's enough. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we, it's easy to be comfortable. It's yeah. actually not that difficult to get me to a place where I'm comfortable going, I can write that dude off. Oh. But it's like, one, I just ha- as a child, I did, under dubious things, I just have a hard time. Anyways, that's not the point of this. Um, that's why Jamie, Jamie blocked me and everything, and then... After all this was done, he like I was, I must have just been in a list of like a hundred people. He had to like yeah, it email, was like the AA. Yes. When you go to AA, you got to go apologize to everybody that you did, and yeah. you were just on, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's hundred percent what it was. He went and made amends. It was a very AA thing that he did afterwards. He went on the Ro- Rogan and he went on with Stanhope because like that's how I knew Jamie was because he was a Stanhope opener. Oh yeah, and there's this weird thing about like because I became sort of this regional Stanhope opener. I felt part of this weird, like, network of other regional Stanhope openers. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. There's, like, Stopka in Chicago, and there's Andy Andrist up in the Northwest, and there'd be, like, Carlos Valencia over here, and Glenn Wool, and, and what, it was all these guys that I, you, I, I knew them from opening for Stanhope. Yeah. And Jamie was in this famous video uh, called The Austin Incident with Stanhope, where uh, Stanhope had... Alex Jones was just supposed to come on stage and introduce him. Yeah. And it just went haywire. And, like, he got into a big fight with his, like, guy in the army and whatever. But Alex like, Jones did? Yeah. It was, like, this what? big thing. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's online. You can find it. And uh, it's just a chaotic thing. But I knew Jamie from that. 
So I got actually it was Big J, and then I had Jamie and Glenn Wool, another one of them, do a co-headline uh, show, and then Jim Jeffries. So that was my festival. That's a nice festival. Um, yeah, it was it was good. I mean, in retrospect, it was it was like you know, I mean, it it looks great in retrospect, I, and it wasn't that. Like I actually, that was the first. That was the only year I really made good money in the festival because Jim was such a fucking perfect timing booking. Yeah, it was like it just exploded. But um, yeah. So me and Jay, because it was such an early, I think thing. And, and look, reality is me and Jay are just put us on the road together. We both take our shoes off when we get in the thing. We both like the room to be at this temperature. We both like it to be decently clean. We both like the what. Like I'm as a good match. Jay's very particular. And I work well with his particular, so we're just yeah. good. We're a good hang. Together. I forgot what we were even talking about, but now yeah, that's Jack, what we're I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm good at. Yeah. I'll put a pin in that shit. Yeah, that was all to. loop, loop back to <laughs> it. Um, so uh, we became buddies from that, and then I got to know the other Legion of Skanks from it. And so, like when I'd come to New York, we'd hang, and then eventually it was like I'd crash on his couch when I came to New York, and then he'd start bringing me on the road a little bit. It just progressively got. I mean, he was smart. He brought me along slowly, too. He didn't just immediately bring me on the road. Yeah. Because we were, like, kind of buddies or because I hired him for my festival. He, like, waited, and I got a little further along, and then it made and sense And you got better, and when you were yeah. ready to go, you just went. And, uh, man, I mean, couldn't ask for a better friend in the fucking business. And, yeah. And not, you know, like, not that he doesn't do stuff for me. Again, I don't think Jay would ever do anything for me I wasn't ready for. Um, but I, just in the sense of, like, when I moved to New York, like, you know, my girl, uh, when she had a job initially and then one day that place was just closed, like, you know, we we're under the table. So like, yeah. Uh, so like one day that job closed and we don't, have, it doesn't mean it like, didn't even tell us. It just yeah. Was, well, I don't know what I'm saying. Us. It's not me. It was her. So, yeah. Um, so his girl got her a job at the stand. Oh, I should probably, anyways, it's fine. Uh, anyways, her, at the stand bookstore. <laughs> I just probably shouldn't be revealing this place to hire people under the table. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, he's just been so good to me. You know what I mean? Like, I'd go over to his place every Sunday and watch, like, the Eagles play, and he'd feed me and, and, and whatever, you know, and have yeah. drinks and weed. And he was just, like, super cool to me. And, you know, it's the coolest part about that, and it's not to say I'm going to ever be either one of these two or in this lineage of anything, but, like, he always explained the reason he was so kind was because – Patrice and David Tell were that to him. Yeah. You know, Attell brought him on the road a lot, and Patrice was always, like, good to giving him advice and things like that. And he was like, he's like, they, they would, you know, if I went on the road and the money wasn't good enough, they'd kick a little extra money in, too. So some, sometimes when I'm on the road with him, if the money's not good enough, he'll kick me a couple extra hundred bucks to, like, make That's it nice. worth it. And That's stuff, very you know? nice. Yeah, he's great. He's super great to me. So I can't say enough stuff. And also, he's so much fun to work with because you don't get – that's what I was saying to you about him is, like, comedy club waitresses love Jay because – you know, you see me, you know, I do a decent amount of crowd work, but you're going to like, you know, you're going to see a 45 minutes, even if I'm doing crowd work, 35 minutes of those going to be the same. Yeah. I'm going to do 10 minutes of like bullshit that just gets me into material. I'm not going to do different. Jay's show might be in almost entirely different five times through the course of the weekend. Wow. So waitresses love him. You know, he'll have like three bits that are linchpin bits that he'll just find how to get in between them or whatever. Mm-hmm. No longer complete things, but it's like he really beautiful minds it. Uh, finding how to fucking get from one thing to the next. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's great like that. Can't I can't thank him enough. And it's good work, you know. Well, that's that's a great that's a great that's a great uh, that's a great story of uh, of somebody who's do, been doing it almost eleven years to see the progress of of what comedy will really bring you if you stick with it. If you don't mm-hmm. quit, if you don't, you know, just give up I mean a lot of people do they just say well fuck it Patrice when Patrice died and they did the Opie and Anthony episode about Patrice O'Neill Louis C.K. said the best thing he was like if you want to be the best comic in the world all you have to do is not die he's like if you just stick with this and you just keep going and you just whatever like that's the point it's, you really yeah. do I mean anyone who does this long enough is gonna get good yeah it's like it's almost impossible not to get good like it's it's just effort so it's like if you can just not give up if you can hang in there and obviously if you're good early it's easier to hang with it because it's like yeah. you'll get rewards and so you don't want it but even if it's not being rewarding for you yet if you just stick with it you'll be fine yeah you know so yeah. it's you know and there's a lot of people that I see like that 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 start off maybe a little bit slower, but then they get really good. And then there's some people that are really good, but then they just don't stick with it. It always it's what I like I always try to tell a comic that gets off to uh, let's uh, plug this girl in Chicago. It's Maddie. Uh, I haven't said this to her yet because she's not getting stuff yet. But Maddie Weiner uh, is she's a 19 year old girl in Chicago who is a killer. Really? Fuck man. Uh, yeah, she's so good. 
And like, so a comment like that, you know, she's going to get stuff early. Yeah. You know, and, um, but what will happen is like, you can only get so much stuff, you know, it's like, oh, cool. I'm at the Laugh Factory now. Or, oh, cool. I got a Just for Laugh showcase. Yeah. Well, like, when you get that two years in, well, then five years in, it's like, well, yeah, you were already at the, so now all the people who didn't do it two years in are now there too. And now you're just all there. Yeah. You know, like it levels out, you know, it's like, you can get to Just for, I got the Just for Laughs real early haven't been back for a while you know what i mean so it's like because what are you gonna do you can only give me they're not gonna put me on a fucking gala so it's like there's only so much you can get so yeah. eventually everyone just catches back up with each other you know and it levels out and then always levels and then out. you go and then it's just who's persistent who's gonna want to do the work sure 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 um last thing before we go uh because we got to go to the 702 bar tonight uh in midland showtime at eight o'clock then wednesday at jen's place eight o'clock and then thursday at bottoms up in bay city eight o'clock uh, you want to say like one thing that was an adversity that you uh, turned from a negative into a positive? Um, Career-wise or just life-wise? Uh, either or. Um, well, I mean, it'd be easy for me to say the adoption thing because obviously that is a bit of an adversity and I've really milked that for every fucking dollar it's worth oh, standard yeah. wise. Uh, the work in progress is the last year because, I mean, I got hit by a transport truck in January last year. Oh, yeah. Uh, while well, I was on tour, and uh, it all came down on me. I had to pay the entire bill of that. My girl left me the next day. What? Yeah, was you got hit by a car, song. and then they just left it. Transport truck left me the next day. I mean, it's more complicated than that. I don't want to just say she just left me up. It was her family wanted to go back home. She was very close to her family. I knew that, like, if I got in between that, it was the death of a relationship. Anyways. Yeah, so the girl I love very much too. But uh, I saw her like twice again after that. I I wrote out the rest of our sublet in uh, in New York. Then I moved all of our shit back to Toronto. I saw her that one time where she broke up with me for like the second time in that time. And then it was a disaster. All of it was a disaster. I had to move back to my hometown for a while and fucking, which is not, uh, you know, yeah. ideal. Like moved back to my folks at fucking wow. 30 where I haven't lived at home since I was 18. Uh, you know, it's like all the disaster of a year. Uh, like quickly had another romance with another girl that ended fucking disastrously in a day. Like it was a real comical year. And it's like, it's one of those things where you need to tell people in your comic, they're like, oh, you're going to be able to get such great material out of that. And you're like, oh, you don't know how much pain is associated with yeah. this. you got to give me a little breathing room first. But uh, it will get there. And it is like, I learned a lot from it. I slowed down. It slowed me down a lot. because, And that's actually a good thing. Because I've always been, you know, like we were talking about, I got a few things early. Yeah. And so I always just thought I had to keep that pedal down the entire the time, you know? And it's like, I did a lot of stuff I wasn't ready for, probably. I imagine there's a decent amount of things where it's like, if I could look back on it, I would go, ah, I wish I did that four years later than I did it, or two years later, or whatever it yeah. is. Um, so this is the first time Chicago's perfect right now because it's just, it's it's still in the biz, but it's like, I'm just, it allows me to pop into the business when I need to, and then I can kind of like go back underneath Sharpen the razors, get everything oh, yeah. tight, put my ducks back in a row, pay off all this fucking horse shit I got to pay wow. off from all of it. And then, you know, by the time I'm ready to go back, it's like I'm that much closer. Because I don't think anyone makes it before 16 years in. Yeah. I really do think 16 years is like the, from everyone I've seen get successful, naturally. I mean, there's Kevin Hart's, there's fucking diseases, there's whatever. 16 years, though, to me is like if you're a really critically successful comedian, that's going to be the amount of time you need before you start breaking. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I got five years left for that. So if I spend another one in Chicago before I go back, it's like, it's all timed better. You yeah. Know? And it's like, I was such a rush to get to New York City the entire time I was in Toronto that, uh, yeah, it was, it was a nice wake up call to be like, ah, chill out a little bit. Yeah. You know? so, it make you appreciate life a little more. And... Yeah, for sure. And like, also, I was like, I was, uh, you know, I was always good to girlfriends, but like, until you, I always felt like I won every relationship I was ever in my entire life. Like, yeah. I felt like when I was out of the relationship, I was like, I'm on to bigger and better things. And this is the first time where I was like, ah, fuck, I wish I had that back. You yeah. Know? It makes you like, yeah, it makes you reevaluate things. And like, not even just with girls, but just everything in your life that comes from this where you're like, I do ship rocked. I'm like, fuck, that's precious. I got to remember that that is super cool. This makes you appreciate things a little more once you get hit by a fucking truck, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Fucking A. Yeah. Well, the, the, go the people watching out here go get, go get hit by a truck <laughs> yeah, alright yeah. thanks a lot for coming out Rob we'll uh, see you uh, tonight at the 702 Wednesday at Jen's place in Hemlock and Thursday at Bottoms Up take her easy